Daniela Bonita Bermúdez Carolina Puerto Rico Reo de Okay, we'll start with this. Some very disappointing news by way of the reigning unified super middleweight champion, Franchone Cruz, who tweeted, So Triller and Golden Boy Promotions couldn't make my fight happen, but Cano is a go. It's all good and good for him. My time will come, and what's meant for me is meant for me. I just don't like my time, character, career, and life played with. I was a professional, as was Cita Ruse, and once again, shit end of the stick. This is women's boxing. She busted her ass to get a visa and ready to fly out today. No promo for our fight or anything, but working to get the best to fight the best. Entertain and put food on our tables. Women always secondary to BS when we work hard. Both of us, unified champions. As you can imagine, French on Cruise is upset. She's been waiting for this fight. I've been telling you guys, this is the most important fight anywhere at or around these weights. And this fight its outcome will affect the pecking order of all of these divisions, not just 168, 160, and even 154 as well. It will affect the pecking order moving forward because there will be a reigning undisputed champion to unseat, to dethrone, with Clarissa all tied up doing the MMA thing. The next best target would have been the winner of this fight. You know, initially, this fight was supposed to go down on the undercard of Lopez versus Cambosos Jr., and we all know what happened. That fight got delayed because... Very recently, Teofimo contracted COVID-19. As a result of that, this fight got moved, got rescheduled. It was supposed to go down on the undercard of Fat Joe versus Ja Rule versus... Well, look what happened. Franchon is frustrated. I don't blame her. She's upset and she can't hide it. Teofimo Lopez took to social media stating, He's starving, quote unquote, to which Franchon replied, Cap, because it does seem like all cap. Her fight got delayed because of him. I don't know. If what the people over there at Golden Boy Promotions and Triller are trying to do is reschedule Franchon Cruz versus Aline Cita Ruz for the undercard of Lopez versus Camposos Jr., that might be the case because that fight's set to go down in the very near future. And we don't know what the undercard for that fight is supposed to look like. So maybe this fight will be added to that fight, that card. But that doesn't make this any less frustrating. These girls have already put a lot of time, a lot of effort into the preparation for this fight only to have the rug pulled from under them just on the eve of it, right before the fight is supposed to go down. It's hard to keep your morale up in a situation like that. Triller, since first dipping their toe in the pool of combat sports, the world of boxing, have shown us that they're quite unstable. They're on shaky ground over there. And this is just another example. This is a fairly simple situation to where both combatants are on board and they want to do the fight. There shouldn't be any issues. There shouldn't be any discrepancies. And it's not a painfully expensive fight, so what's the problem? I just hope they reschedule it. And that the fighters are compensated for the time they've already put in. In other news, earlier today in Ekaterinburg, Russia, reigning interim WBC bantamweight champion... Tatiana Zrazevskaya was upset by Mexico's own Jessica Gonzalez. I watched this thing, whole time thinking to myself, Tatiana looks flat. Looks a lot like Tatiana is struggling with the height of Jessica Gonzalez, the durability of Jessica Gonzalez, and the volume. Jessica would not let herself be outworked by the otherwise statuesque Russian because Tatiana, she's got generous physical dimensions as far as bantamweights go. She's tall for this weight, rangy for this weight, but her power, you know, she couldn't get Jessica's respect. Jessica was on the better end of those exchanges. Jessica Gonzalez had no reason 
to win this fight. I mean, she really didn't. She was coming off a loss to Hyun Mi Choi in 2017 and another loss to Chantel Cameron in 2018. And that was the last time that Jessica was in action, at least on paper. This fighter hasn't fought since 2018. That's roughly three years ago. Could almost say it's a cherry pick gone wrong. Jessica sports a professional record of seven wins, five losses, and two draws, though she's never been stopped. Ahead of this fight with Tatiana Zrazevskaya, which took place in Tatiana's neck of the woods, Jessica had only won one fight in her last six fights. You heard that right. She was one and five in her last six outings, her last six boxing matches. You look at a situation like this on paper, Jessica Gonzalez traveling abroad, traveling afar for a fight in Ekaterinburg, Russia against Russia's own Tatiana Zrazevskaya, and you get the sense that, you know, Jessica needs a miracle. But when you watch the fight, you see that it's Jessica's height that Tatiana's struggling with. It's her durability, her ability to take a hard shot, keep on coming, and her volume. She would not allow herself to be outworked by Tatiana Zrazevskaya. She was able to give as good as she could get. Most of Jessica Gonzalez's victories throughout her pro career are against pedestrian-level competition, girls with losing records, upside-down records, journeywomen. This win over Tatiana Zrazevskaya is the single most significant victory in Jessica Gonzalez. Gonzalez's entire body of work, her entire resume. She is now the mandatory challenger for none other than the reigning WBC bantamweight champion, her countrywoman, Yuli Hang Luna, who is going to be in action later on today in her native Mexico, south of the border, against the pedestrian level opponent. I don't know if it's going to be Candy Sandoval or somebody else. I'm hearing a lot of different things, but it does look like a little tune-up kind of fight, keep busy kind of fight, because Jessica and Yuli Hang Luna are both based out of Mexico. I expect that the WBC might actually order this thing in a timely fashion in the very near future because it is an entirely doable fight. I don't imagine that Jessica has any outlandish purse demands that would render the fight difficult to make, difficult to get over the line. Up until this point, Jessica Gonzalez has been a journeywoman. It's a hell of a victory for her. This is, I mean, ahead of this fight, Tatiana sported a professional record of 11 wins, no losses. Looked like the kind of fighter that was going to do big things and she had an off night that's the story the wbc's interim bantamweight title has effectively changed hands in ekaterinburg you know what they say theater of the unexpected right oscar valdez versus robson come take out let's talk about the fight this is robert some people seem to think so some people seem to think that robson come thoroughly outboxed oscar valdez over 12 rounds I am not in agreement with these people, and I can only tell you how I scored the fight and why. What a robbery to me. And it's not that Oscar Valdez didn't struggle with Robson Conseca's base style. He did. He ran that struggle on the left side of his face. It's not that Robson Conseca didn't have success. It's that that success was short-lived. The ideology of how many of you out there score a fight and how the judges ringside score a fight, there are going to be discrepancies, but some of these discrepancies, they are predictable. You don't coastal foreign soil. You hear that all the time, and fights like this are why. Now, first round of this fight, seemed to me that Robson Kunsekau was in control of the situation, very much in control. Shooting that jab. Getting off first when he did it. That's important that Robson Kunsekau, at least in the early goings of this fight, he wasn't just sticking and moving, he was initiating the action. He was getting off first, giving off the appearance of being in control. Oscar Valdez could not get within range to land a jab of his own and set up his own punches because he was being met at the door by Robson Kunsekau's jab. Robson was the taller, rangier guy. I had Rob and picking up those first two rounds. And Oscar Valdez just nicking the third round. If there was a swing round in this fight, as far as I'm concerned, it was the third. That was due to that early salvo. That offensive onslaught Oscar Valdez let go as Robson Conseil was circling away back to the ropes. Oscar landed the cleaner punches in that round. The cleaner and more meaningful punches in the third round. So I thought he had done enough to just nick it, though I could see some of you out there scoring that round the other way. It sounds like a lot of you did. I had Oscar just nicking the third round. I had Robson Conseil picking up the fourth. Controlling the distance with the jab. Ripping some eye-catching uppercuts throughout the course of the round. I had Robson Conseil picking up the fourth. I had Robson Conseil picking up the fifth. It was more of the same in the fifth round. To reiterate, in the first five rounds of this fight, 
the early goings of the match. Robson Konsekau wasn't just sticking and moving. He was getting off, but he was getting off first. He was initiating the action, preventing Oscar Valdez from getting within range the land punches of his own by firing off that piston jab of his that met Oscar Valdez at the door. That was in the early goings of the fight, the first five rounds. Had Konsekau picking up the fifth round, Oscar Valdez on aggression and meaningful punches, eye-catching shots you don't have to look for. Had Oscar picking up the sixth round. This is where Oscar started to turn things around. This is where Oscar took the bull by the horns and started showing more initiative. At least for me. The same continued in the seventh round, which I also gave to Oscar based on his aggression, eye-catching shots, being able to catch up to and stay on top of Robson Konsekau. Robson, who appeared to be... Looked like he was fading. In the seventh round, it looked a lot like the pace of the fight was starting to catch up to Robson Konsekau, who... You know, before that fight, that guy never fought in the 12 rounds. Of you heard that right. This is a guy who never won 12 rounds before. That might explain why Robson came on so strong in the first five rounds of this thing, whereas Oscar, Oscar was almost complacent, almost giving rounds away. He hadn't hit the gas yet. Yeah, Oscar didn't really hit the gas till about the sixth or the seventh round. You know, maybe he felt a sense of urgency in the sixth and seventh rounds because he knew he was behind, because he knew that Robson Konsekau had separated himself from him, and, you know, he had a sizable lead. Just seems to me like... Robson Konsekau started fading in rounds six, maybe seven. He started fading at the half, fading at the midway point of this fight because of his expenditure of energy early in the fight, early in the match, the first five rounds, which you know, most of he swept. Fading down the stretch can be an ambiguous term if you don't characterize it. The way I characterize Robson Konsekau fading down the stretch is more and more often you saw his back against those ropes, circling away from Oscar, as opposed to what we saw from him in the early goings of the fight, staying on his jab, taking it to the champion, and getting off first. By round six and seven, that's really not what he was doing. In the beginning, you were taking it to us. By the midway point, he was taking it to you. So I gave Oscar the seventh round. I gave him the eighth round as well. And by the eighth round, I had the fight scored four rounds to four. Tie score. Robson Konsekau was not the man in the eighth round that he was in those first five rounds. Rounds one, two, arguably three, four, and five. He seemed a little bit more depleted. He was retreating a lot more, giving up ground, giving up real estate. His back didn't end up on those ropes on its own. Oscar put him there. You guys need to be more mindful of stuff like that. It's kind of like the Guillermo Regandiao versus John Real Casamero fight, where you got guys that are actually giving Regandiao rounds based on maneuvering and angling himself away from shots, but he's not really taking it to the champion. When you're the guy that's doing all the retreating, you're not the ring general. The judges, they may decide not to give you those rounds because you're retreating. You're not engaging. I mean, you're in Tucson, Arizona. You're in Oscar Valdez's neck of the woods. It's primarily an Oscar Valdez crowd. He's the reigning champion and you decide you want to coast? Where's your common sense? You think people aren't noticing how much time your back's being put on those ropes and how much you're circling away from this guy. You think people can't see that you're not engaging with this guy as much as you were in the first five rounds of this thing. You think people can't see that? It's probably why your scorecard looks the way that it looks. It's probably why you think Robson Konsekau did enough to win this fight. You keep thinking that. I was watching that fight telling myself, I hope Robson doesn't think he's picking up rounds doing all that stuff. We didn't come here to watch you shake and bake. We came here to watch you take it to the champion, and that's what you're going to have to do. Back on the ropes, on the road, these guys think he's winning rounds. It never fucking fails, it just doesn't. I think the ninth round is a controversial round for a lot of people because that's the round where Robson Konsekau was deducted a point for rabbit punching without being given a warning first. And I agree, he should have been given a warning. Leading up to that ninth round, I hadn't seen Robson's punches sail to the back of Oscar's head very much, so why referee Tony Zanio decided to... He to warn the guy. Because in deducting that point, he cost Robson Konsekau that round. The ninth round went to Oscar. The tenth round, too, as the pace had noticeably caught up to Robson Konsekau, back against the ropes, being pushed around, being pressured, eye-catching, meaningful punches. They're not coming from Robson, they're coming from Oscar. The eleventh round was an interesting round. Perhaps that's a round that some of you out there gave to Robson Konsekau because he started throwing more. So more of an effort to take it to the champion. Though not enough for me to give Robson that round. That's right. I gave that round to Oscar Valdez. He nicked it for me with the eye-catching shots, the eye-catching 
hooks to the body, the kind of punches that neither I or the judges have to look all that hard. You don't have to look for them. Those are the kind of punches that win rounds, whether you like it or not. In the 12th round, this guy gets on his bike. As if he hadn't spent a substantial amount of time on it already. This guy starts showboating. I don't know what he thinks he's doing. So I gave the 12th the Oscar. You know what I think the biggest problem is with these kind of fights? You got guys out there that score this thing like it's an Olympic qualifier. This amateur style we see from fighters like Robson Conseco. It's very neat. It's very tidy. But this ain't the Emmys. This is the pros. You have to do more to separate yourself from the man opposite the ring, especially when the man opposite the ring is the reigning champion and you're in his top. What, you think you're going to come here and coast and win that belt? You think you're going to make it close and win that belt? You think you're going to shimmy and shuffle your way to a world title on the road? Well, let me tell you something. It's not going to fucking work. It didn't work for Arislandi Lara against Canelio Alvarez. It didn't work for Guillermo Rigondeau against John Riel Casimero. And last night, it didn't work for Robson Conseco. These are all guys that come from very solid amateur backgrounds, but this ain't the Emmys. I don't know why people think you could spend that much time moving around and win the round. Perhaps the people that were scoring this fight, the people that think Robson did enough to win it, perhaps those people weren't actually scoring the fight based on the fight, scoring with their feelings, their thoughts on Oscar Valdez's positive anti-doping test. I think that a lot of people likely had that in mind while they watched this fight, and they weren't about to do Oscar Valdez any favors. That's what I think. Not that they had to. I'll tell you that Oscar Valdez didn't look too hot out there portions of this fight. I'll tell you that he struggled with Robson Conceicao a lot more than he struggled with Miguel Burchelt. He was wearing that struggle on the left side of his face. I'll tell you that Oscar had to work for it. But he won the fight. Wasn't his best showing, to be honest. And maybe the stress of the last couple of days, the last week or so, had something to do with his performance. Or maybe it's just that Robson Conceicao's particular style, it gives Oscar a lot of problems. And that's why they got all that amateur history. Styles do make fights, after all. But this fight communicates to me is that an educated jabber, an educated stick and move guy can give Oscar a lot of problems, a lot of problems moving forward. Guy like Jamel Herring, guy like Shaklor Stevenson. The winner of that fight. Stick and move, stay on your jab, stay behind it to keep Oscar in front of you, and don't let him create an environment where it starts to look like he's pushing you around, like he's backing you into those ropes and you're the one retreating. Get off and get off first. Because you're not just there to disarm Oscar Valdez, keep him outside of the pocket, outside of his sweet spot. You're not just there to do that. You're there to land scoring blows. And you have to make it clear and apparent. Yeah, I think Oscar won the fight. He just didn't look good doing it. And we can see what his problem areas are. A tall, rangy jabber that can stick and move and keep up the pace. With straight punches from the outside. Can definitely give Oscar Valdez a lot of problems. This was his first defense of the WBC Super Featherweight title. And, you know, congratulations to him. 